welcome to theheart.org. Uh, my name is Professor Tony Gershwick. I'm at, uh, in Leicester in the UK and I'm here in Munich at the ESC 2012 and uh, we're privileged to be able to interview some of the PIs and co-PIs uh, presenting at the late breaking and hotline sessions. And uh, I'm honoured today to be joined by uh, Holger Thiel uh, from Leipzig. Um, and uh, he's addressed a very important question. And the question is, if you have a patient with cardiogenic shock, how can you optimise their outcome? And I think this is a question that we ask all the time. Should we put an intraortic balloon pump in or not? Does it make a difference? Uh, and these are potentially practice changing studies. So tell me a little bit about the background. What made you decide to do this study? And uh, tell us a little bit about, about the study itself. As you mentioned, so we looked for the adriatic balloon pump in our randomized clinical trial. The problem with the adriatic balloon pump, it's more than you know, nearly 50 decades in place. We use it since more than 50 or nearly 50 decades, but there's no proven benefit uh, of the intraortic pump. We know that it can improve the um, diastolic blood pressure, that it can improve coronary perfusion, but there are no randomized clinical data showing that the intraortic balloon pump can improve the clinical outcome. And that's the reason um, why we performed this trial. And the uh, guidelines, so yeah. No, just to say, many of the trials, uh, such as the BSIS trials, would suggest you may not need it. No, no, no. So, 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 but the so it's very important but the, study. But the Beezus, Beezus one trial was a totally different set. Yes, yes, yes. But well, there isn't many randomised trials, but those randomised trials tend to say you should use it less than we do use it. And we use yeah. it rather emotionally because it's there and we feel the patient will benefit. That's why it's very important to have these sorts of studies that you're going to tell us about. And there's a reason we thought this is one you mentioned, so this is a totally different yes, clinical yes. setting. It's a high risk PCI in stable patients. We look for cardiogenic shock patients. And if you look for the guidelines, uh, the European guidelines say it's a class 1C recommendation to use the angiotic balloon pump in patient cardiogenic shock. And the American guidelines even say it's a class 1B recommendation. Yeah. Although there are no data out for, or no randomized data out. We only have registry data. And these registry data are showing. One, on the one hand side, it might improve the clinical outcome if we perform thrombolysis or no reperfusion. If we perform primary PCI, as a meta-analysis out from um, a Dutch group, it showed that there might be an, even an increase of mortality yes. if we use the intraortic balloon pump in primary PCI in patient cardiac in shock. But that but may be only registry data. But that's because it may be sicker patients who have been selected and were going to sure. die anyway and may have died more so without the balloon pump. So you, you, this that's a, but that's the reason why we said we need a randomized clinical trial. And that's why I'm setting you up to tell us about it, because it's important yeah. that yeah. we don't use registry data. Yeah. So, so the trial we did is currently the largest trial which has been performed, or the largest randomized clinical trial in cardiac shock. So we included 600 patients in this is trial, which were, uh, were in the, where the patients were randomized to either um, the injury group pump or conventional therapy. It's very important that all these patients had to undergo revascularization. So this is what we have. This is the most important evidence what we have. So all patients were in cardiac unit shock after an acute myocardial infarction, and all these patients had to undergo revascularization. And then they were randomized to enter the group pump or not. Define your, your definition of cardiogenic shock in this study, because yeah. there are many different definitions. We need yes. to know that we all understand what you're talking about. Yeah, so we used the clinical um, definition for cardiogenic shock, so we did not look for the cardiac index, for example, or for the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. We um, defined cardiogenic shock as um, systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury, or catheter mines required to have it. Um, higher than 90 millimeters right. of mercury. So 80% of our patients were on catheter mines at randomization. Okay. They all had to have um, lung edema, and in addition, they all needed at least one sign of endorgan, hy hy endorgan hyperperfusion, such as, for example, impaired renal function, um, elevated serum lactate, which is probably the most sensitive measure of, um, of endorgan hyperperfusion. This was necessary. Did they get an echocardiogram before randomization? No, this was not necessary. Okay. We so looked for the, um, for the left ventricular ejection fraction in these patients, um, but not, it was not required before randomization. Okay. So, here, so here's the patient. So how did you power your study up for 600 patients? So the, the assumption was um, that we would have an 
a decrease in the mortality of 12%. Twelve percent. So this is what the data and uh, what the registries have um, shown yes, previously. Yeah. So that's the reason we powered on our trial on the data we had from registries. Eighty percent power, ninety percent power. Um, Eighty percent power. Eighty percent power. So Eighty percent power to a reduction, twelve percent. Sure. The Absolutely. immortality. Immortality. Primary yeah. endpoint. Yeah. At what but what we time? always have to keep in, in mind uh, 30 days. We always have to keep because the mortality is so high. Yes. That's the reason why. So you don't need too many patients um, because the event yeah, rate yeah. is so high in patients. And what, what was your predicted mortality without the blue pump? Um, 56 yeah. percent, which and would also be that's in that's that what we yeah. have seen in, in yeah, that. Uh, all in the yeah. Yeah. data shows it's about. Yeah to around 53% mortality. So this yeah. is very, very important. So this is a robust study so far. Yeah. And so patients were randomized and had intervention. Did they have anything else uh, in terms of support? Pharmacological? No, so, yeah, pharmacological support. So this is what, so in Germany and in Austria, we have German-Austrian guidelines, which, is, which are purely dedicated to pay, to the treatment of patient cardiogenic shocks. They all, do not only deal with the revascularization, no, no. they all also deal with the in intensive care unit um, and how to treat these patients in the ICU. And um, there is also the recommendation for if you need catheter mines that you should use as a vasoconstrictor, you should use norepinephrine, and as an inotrope, you should use dobutamine. Okay. And we had a very good adherence to our German-Austrian guidelines. In both groups? In both groups, yeah. Okay. In both so the only difference between these groups was the use of the intraortic balloon pump. For how long was the intraortic balloon pump in place for? In median? It should, in median it was three days. Three days? Yeah. So let's hear the results. Let's hear the results. There was no significant difference in mortality between the two groups. So the, there was a 1.3 percent mortality difference but however the p value was 0 0.69 what was the sort of what were the absolute figures in the it in was thir um, nearly 40 percent 39.6 percent in the um, IVP group and for, and I think 41 percent uh, um, okay, in, so in, in the control group roughly the sort of mortality you would expect but not a major impact of the interiotic balloon pump. Okay. We also look for the cool. perform multivariable modeling to account for any potential influenza, even after multivariable modeling, and also after we analyze it for per protocol as also for intention to treat. There was no difference between the you two. You did per protocol. Those who could get them. No, the the no, it was defined well. according to them. The protocol was defined as uh, if the patient really had an acute myocardial yeah. infarction. Because oh, there were some patients in, for example, they had Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Oh. Um, so that's, that's, that's um, our definition of the protocol. Yeah. So before we all throw our intraortic balloon pumps away in cardiogenic shock, which may be the implications you will tell us, were there any subgroups? Big anterior infarcts, uh, young patients, uh, uh, we Any subgroups at all with cardiogenic shock where you'd still reach for the intraortic blue pump? This is very important. We look for, you always have to be very cautious if you look for a subgroup analysis in a negative trial. So that's yeah, yeah, exactly. you always have to be careful. Um, there was only one subgroup which might have had a benefit from the intraortic blue It was the age group of less than 50 years. However, um, this were only 70 patients because um, the age group of less than 50 years was very small and also the p-value for interaction was not significant for yeah. this yeah. Uh, for the comparison to the other age groups and we also looked in further detail and, uh, into this group so this were patients who were not um, at higher risk for example so these patients even had lower mortality in comparison to the, 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 to the other age groups. Um, and we also looked for all the secondary endpoints yes. in these patients. Yes, but we yes. looked, we had very sensitive measures. So yes. For example, we looked for serum lactate between the two yes, groups, yes, 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 yes. Um, between the IRBP group. Uh, we looked for the length of intensive care unit stay. We looked for uh, renal function. We looked for um, he, um, the dose of catheter mines or the number of catheter mines that we need. There was no difference. Coronary anatomy? No, no difference at all. Okay. So, we're coming to the end of this short and interesting interview. So, is your recommendation, if you were to report to the guideline committees, that you do not need to have an intraortic balloon pump if you're treating a patient with cardiogenic shock? So, if you 
purely look only on our data. So for 30 days, you could say for 30 days there's no difference in outcome, even yeah. in, in, in any and other secondary endpoint. Yeah. And regarding guidelines, I don't know how the guidelines committees will act on our um, results. So first of all, we have to say that the current guideline recommendation of class 1B or class 1C might be too optimistic. If you really look for the um, real evidence, what yeah, you yeah. Have, so probably the guidance should have said its class two recommendation before. So I'm not sure. Personally, I believe I only can speculate on it. So the guidance, probably the right guideline recommendation, will go down. So two, two, a couple of questions both, as we finish. Firstly, w are, when are you looking at patients after 30 days? Are you still following up at one yeah, year? Sure. So by protocol, we are looking for after six months and also after 12 months. Okay. However, tomorrow we will present only the 30-day results because we can only have the 30-day results. So we shouldn't throw anything away at yes. the moment until we've got longer-term data. Sure. That's number one. I think the second message is that people should, if the patient's very sick, still consider the use of support, uh, mechanical support, perhaps. It, uh, we're not saying that they shouldn't consider it. We just don't have the evidence yet still that it's beneficial. But the most striking thing is that cardiogenic shock continues to have a very high mortality. And for all important. the things that we've impacted on in interventional cardiology, the one thing we haven't impacted on is cardiogenic shock. And uh, that's for the future. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Great thank study. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, very important. So thank you indeed. Thank you.